Hello, and welcome to Cognitum, a show dedicated to exploring the present and future of science and technology. I'm your host, Iosef Gerstein. Joining us tonight is Dr. Harry Crane, a professor of statistics at Rutgers, author of Probabilistic Foundations of Statistical Network Analysis, and co-founders of Researchers One. Harry, welcome. Thanks a lot. So artificial intelligence is on the tip of everybody's tongue nowadays. What do you think are the main advantages of this technology? Well, actually, so my, so my background being a statistician, I have a, you know, one particular kind of view from which I see uh, artificial intelligence and how it's being approached by uh, techniques such as machine learning and you know, other data science tools. And I guess one of the things that I think about a lot, um, I guess one of the, the, the main benefit, I suppose, is that these techniques are allowing us to process and to make decisions from very large, very large data sets and apply them in domains that previously uh, we we may not have been able to as a result of increased you know inc as a result of increased capability to compute and to calculate you know through things like paral parallel computing and so on and so forth. Um, but one of the things that I, I think about the most is actually you know focusing on the the term term itself, and I, I do co I do have some concern about the uh, there is quite a bit of you know hope that AI will on what AI might deliver for us. And on the one hand, there's concerns about becoming overly, perhaps overly dependent on it, but maybe setting our expectations a bit too high in, ter in, in terms of what it can deliver and what it can do for us. Um, I, I think that in, in a lot of domains, there is, no, there, there is a difference. So it's not really intelligence in, in the way that I look at it. Um, it, is, it is kind of advanced computation and the application of uh, statistical techniques and other techniques to make sense and to make high-level high, high level calculations on large corpuses of data. But in a lot of domains, there is still no substitute for real intelligence, human intelligence. So how would you delineate the difference between intelligence and computation? Right. So I, I've thought about this a bit, and I, one of the things that makes data science and machine learning and tools like that so uh, so powerful is the ability to take large amounts of data and to process it and to do calculations and to come up with a coherent um, decision making tool uh, for example uh, so in order to in order to use those tools requires or at least one of the main uh, benefits is that we have a lot of data and we can Draw, draw conclusions from ha with, with that data. That's something that's very difficult for an individual person to do, right? Our brain capacity is not really uh, geared towards making large-scale calculations. In fact, uh, you know, the average, you know, the average person, even very intelligent people, you know, to carry out calculations in our heads is not something that we're particularly uh, good at. One thing that we are good at, though, uh, whereas a computer can draw, uh, can, can process millions of data points, billions of data points, and we can't, you know, we can hardly process 10 or 20 data points in our heads. Uh, what, we are, what we are very good at is making decisions with almost no data, right? How often, you know, we, we encounter situations we've never been in before, and we're able to make decisions that are coherent, sound, and, uh, you know, able, best, you know, best for the circumstances that we find ourselves in. And so that's something that I've thought a lot about in the context of you know we, reasoning under uncertainty. That's kind of the prime. That is the primary way that people reason under uncertainty is in situations in which we have no prior data. Um, and I've thought a lot about how that actually. What is that process? Um, how do we actually? What's driving that process? Uh, how can we make decisions without having any data? Well, it's not that we don't have any data, but it's just that the data is, or, you know, the way that we've stored it is a bit different. So one thing that we, 
we do mentally is we're, we're better at contextualizing things, whereas a computer doesn't really know the context for anything unless it's told exactly what assumptions it's supposed to make and calculations it's supposed to carry out. Uh, we're, very, we're able to put things in context and to see the structure of the situation and to draw conclusions from that. So humans are better at structuring, whereas machines mostly are using these computational systems in order to make uh, decisions or predictions based on multiple, multiple repetitions of the same thing. Yeah, I believe that's, I believe that's maybe, uh, that's the core distinction that I, I uh, at least it's rolling around in my head at the, at the moment. And it, it leads to some interesting questions, um, particularly about how we might want to better design or, or think about developing formal techniques, statistical techniques, computing techniques um, in, the, in the domain, in, in this new domain uh, or in, in more complex domains as, as data sets become more and more complex. And that's something I talk about uh, a bit in the book. The book's on network analysis. And so one, uh, one, you know, one way in which complex systems, complex situations have bec have are, are sometimes modeled or often modeled is using techniques from the, the concept of a network where we're not only modeling individual observations, but we're also interested in the way in which those, those, uh, those observations interact with one another. Those interactions are what provide the structure, and that structure is in, you know, instrumental to understanding the system. And what I talk, a lot, what I talk about in the book is how our, our, the, the classical picture of how statistical tools have been developed over the past 50, 60 years or so, and still how they are being applied in uh, an approach from the standpoint of you know, most conventional uh, machine learning techniques today is, you know, we, so we, talk, we talked earlier uh, previously about this idea of a coin toss, right? And in some, at some level, classical statistics builds off of this idea of repeated coin tossing. And it's built, a, built, out, built it out pretty well and pretty substantially. We now can handle things like time series, spatial, spatially oriented data. We can incorporate a lot of dependence and incorporate some amount of structure into our modeling. But at the end of the day, it really is geared towards data that is that has relatively flat or simple structure. So a sequence is just is, is just a list um, or a set or an array or some kind of you know tabular structure that can be that is easily implemented into a computer. And, and so that's that's one thing that the classical picture is kind of gear is, is most geared towards. Another is that the this theory as as in the coin toss, uh, which is assuming that you're tossing the same coin over and over again, you're repeating the same process a large number of times, is based on a high level of regularity and homogeneity in the system. So we have, if I were to toss a coin a thousand times, I would have a thousand repetitions of the same process. Uh, so I would have a thousand statistically identical copies of, of an observation, but these, would also, these are also being assumed to be completely independent of one another, which is, they don't affect one another. And that leads to a very rich mathematical theory, and that's been very fruitful for in a lot of scientific domains. Uh, but the current, the, the, you know, the current challenges uh, within that domain are mostly computational in nature, which is now we have kind of this, we're assuming we have the same kind of relatively unstructured data. We just have a lot more of it. And how can we scale up these methods to handle those, um, to handle that, that large scale problem? The problem I'm interested in, and I think what's more, um, which, w which is, you know, more pressing for you know fu the future is that we're we're now collecting data, which is not just large but it's it's actually quite complex. And if we think about the systems that we're most interesting and in most interested in understanding, and in which we have a our biggest difficulty in handle in in understanding things like the climate or things like the the body. Uh, these are inherently complex systems where different pieces of the system are interacting with, with one another and they're affecting one another in a very complex and kind of you know, incomprehensible way, at least from the standpoint we currently have. And 
my thought on this is that the tools that we have, the tools that I just mentioned, the classical, the classical picture, just isn't really well equipped to handling, to addressing these problems because the classical picture is set up in a domain where we're assuming we have a lot of independent uh, components which aren't interacting very much with one another. And any interactions that they do have, we implement, uh, we kind of implement ourselves through by kind of adding extra structure to the problem. But primarily, it's an unstructured uh, piece of data. And so by doing that, you know, I think there's something lost in the translation from the real world to the, to the application or to the analysis. And so one of the things I've been working towards is a framework in which when we're in this complex domain, the challenges are primarily now conceptual. They're not, they're not uh, computational yet. We don't even need to have a very large system for this to be difficult. What makes it difficult is that the data is, is now quite structured. And representing that structure in a way that's faithful to the, to the real world process and which doesn't interfere with our analysis of it is, um, is something that I'm you know, actively exploring and very interested in developing. But it requires a whole new set of techniques um, that is quite, quite, a, quite a way into the future. But I think that that's the way we need to go if we're able, if we're going to achieve, um, you know, more, I guess, if we can, you know, if we're going to achieve what I would consider to be closer to a human level of intelligence uh, about these systems. So when we go from the old model, which is mostly unstructured data to trying to, f to trying to have a new tool that is going to have structured data it, that will facilitate new approaches to analysis, yes? Well, that's the hope. That's certainly the hope. So, I mean, so, um, we talk, so for example, we talked before about um, replication crisis. And replication crisis affects all of, you know, most, a lot of scientific fields, but it's especially um, affecting it, it, fields that have been especially affected by it are ones like psychology um, and medicine is actually one of the ones. And if we think about, well, what might be, you know, what's one possibility aside from the kind of misapplication of statistics that we, we've talked about? You know, one possibility might be that the tools that we have, the statistical tools we have available to understand a system as complex as, you know, the, the body just aren't, aren't appropriate. For, for the system. Um, if you think about you know, how, 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 a, how these techniques actually get, get applied in trying to understand how a certain drug might affect you know, heart disease or, or, some, or some kind of cancer, um, essentially what's that, what that's doing is you know, what the methods are assuming is that we can intervene on a very, you know, very isolated part of the body without affecting the rest of the system. And that's just not the way, of course, that the, the body works. There's interactions among all parts of the body. Um, and so it would be nice and it would be, you know, I think it would be very beneficial to having a framework that's able to better address and better encode that, um, that structure. So the example that, you know, it may, you know a, a good analogy, I think, to, to think about is that I'm not able to, so I don't, I don't understand Greek. I can't read Greek, okay? But I'm, I can still read Aristotle if I read an, an English translation of, of the original Greek, okay? What's the extent to which I can actually understand Aristotle's philosophy? Well, it depends a lot on the, the quality of the translation. But if I have a good enough translation, I, I can understand it. Uh, I guess I can get maybe the, the, the big idea. Uh, there's always something lost in translation, but I can get the big idea. How does this apply to statistics or to machine learning? Is that we are, uh, w w when, how do we observe nature? We observe the events in nature. That's the kind of the natural language that uh, the real world speaks to us. But when we go to analyze it, we translate those events into some language that we can, anal that we can understand or manipulate or, or analyze. And it's usually some kind of computer language or something that can be implemented into a computer. That is already one step removed from what actually happened. Um, and there's a, there's a major question as to, to what extent is the analysis that I'm doing on my computer faithful to the real world process that I'm trying to understand? Um, and 
you know, so when a climate scientist analyzes, you know, the, a hurricane and they simulate hurricane behavior on their computer, there's obviously not a hurricane happening in the computer, but the, 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 the assumption is that there's something that this, these models are capturing the essence of the problem from the perspective they're, they're approaching it. Uh, I'm not sure that that's actually the case uh, in, a, in, certain, in, a, in a lot of problems involving very complex systems. Um, in genetics or in, in biology, you have you know, the, the, way that a, the way that genes get expressed depends not only on the, you know, the, the particular nucleotides in the sequence, but also in the way that this, that this, uh, you know, this DNA strand is oriented in three-dimensional space and how, it inter how the different parts are interacting with one another in space. Those interactions are, we, we, I, I think, you know, biologists believe and understand that th those are crucial to the way that genes get expressed. Um, but it's very, it's very hard to, uh, there, but it's unclear to the extent to which that's actually being captured in the, in the current paradigm. And that's what makes genetics, you know, among one of many uh, very difficult areas to treat with current statistical methods. So if we develop these new methods and we can start not saving information or, or storing information as arrays of, of, of data, but as some sort of structured data or network, um, what, kind, what kind of future could that open up? And would that bring machines closer to human intelligence? Well, I, I don't, to the last question, I don't think so. Um, uh, I think that it would just be us implementing a more sophisticated, or maybe not a more sophisticated, but just a different um, approach to certain problems. And so I guess the w the one, one way to think about it is I, 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 talked about, I talked about coin tossing as being the bare bones basic example of a statistic on which statistics might be based on, or you know, standard statistical thinking is uh, kind of built upon. From that point of view, within that paradigm, the idea of a network is kind of at the upper limit right now. So we're used to dealing with relatively unstructured data or regularly structured data. Networks get us bumping up against the limits of our current capabilities within that paradigm because we're introducing these interactions. Within a more complex domain, or what I would call complex data analysis, networks are the equivalent of the coin tossing, the sequence of coin tosses. A network, uh, at least the way they're mostly approached now, you think of it as the, you know, the lowest level network is you have a bunch of nodes and they're connected by edges or not. Okay. That's a relatively simple structure. That's a very simple structure compared to how genes and proteins and all these things actually interact with one another. In those cases, it, we, there, there's no reason to think that there, we, to stop at first order interactions. You know, there, there might be, there's, there's likely to be much higher structure that we might not even be able to, we're, we're, we're probably not even able to measure it right now, but as, as technologies advance, you know, we might be able to measure things like not only the way in which two, thing, two objects are interacting, but in which they, their interactions might be interacting with one another as well, and interactions would interact with higher order interactions. Um, those, you know, think of that as a higher order network, how would we treat that? How can we handle those situations? Um, it, so it's, it sounds very complex, and it is very complex, but there are actually mathematical languages and mathematical tools available to encode structures like that more directly into, um, into a computer rather than having to go through the, the route of kind of taking this network, distilling it, essentially digitizing it, um, and then trying to add back structure that we, that we destroyed uh, after the fact. Um, what I'm essentially call, would be calling for here is kind of an analog approach where we take the, take, the structure or, take the structure itself and we try to implement that structure as, you know, as closely to what it actually is as possible and work directly on those structures. And there, are, there is a mathematical framework uh, in which that seems to be possible, and I'm, I'm exploring that. That's not in the book. That's something that I think is many years down the line um, requires quite a bit of work. Not only because um, we don't the the current statistical tools and probability theory isn't there's there's no existing framework for to do those to do those things 
uh, with these objects, but actually a lot of the very fundamental, um, very fundamental ideas in this in this language are kind of at the forefront of computer programming and logic and things like that. So they're still at the very basic level, but I, I do have um, some hope for that, and I'm quite interested in exploring it further. Do you think there might be limitations when you? try to have a new system that is analog and you're still using a digital system, a computer, in order to interact with, with, with this system, in order to analyze this data because fundamentally at the hardware level you are still going off of on-off switches, off of zeros and ones? Right, yeah, so that's a very interesting question and I've, th I've thought about that a bit and I, I've, I've, ta I've talked to I've talked to some people about this. So this is this is work, by the way. I should say that this is work that I've I was doing uh, previously with a postdoc of mine, Demetrius Semencius, who introduced me to uh, some of these ideas. And this this falls under the general uh, heading of what we call uh, data as shape, representing data as sh data as shapes rather than just lists or arrays. Um, but you you get to an interesting point, which is that. The way that computers are currently engineered and set up is is in binary in, di in this digital form, and so we would only be going, we would only be uh, succeeding in implementing this analog structure kind of at the at the software level, and so it's never it's never quite clear. It's not quite clear the extent to which well we're still be we're still being affected by the 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 underlying hardware. But I think you know it's one step at a time in that respect. I I, I think that um, if you, if you ask for another limitation, a more perhaps a more um, down to earth uh, limitation of this, I think would be it's likely that that these that these or at least as of right now these would not be very amenable to computing large, extremely complex things. I mean. One thing that we talked about earlier is that computation has evolved to the point where we can do, we can make many computations in a very short period of time, especially relative to how we were 10 years ago, 10 years before that, and so on. Um, there's a price to be paid for, for that. I mean, there, 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 there's, um, there's, of course, there's no way to, uh, you can't just gain endlessly in one direction without paying a price. And the, co the price that I think we're paying with uh, this enhanced computation um, or at least with working within this framework is what I, what I talked about before, which is that, well, we're, we have these computation, this computational power, but in order to use it, we have to frame our problem in the, in the, you know, within the parameters of what this comp where this computation can operate. And in doing so, we're now, you know, there's an extent to which we have to ask, in, to what ex you know, are we kind of trying to fit... Um, fit something that doesn't quite align, you know, as the structure of the system doesn't quite align, how much are we losing in that translation? How much is being lost in translation? If we want to better represent the structure of the system, well, what's the price to be paid? At least one price that's likely to be paid as of now is a computational cost, is that these things will, they're doing much more precise calculations in the sense that it's it's you know it's an analog it's an analog operation so nothing is being kind of fudged these structures are being very discreetly man manipulated in some way um, but by doing such a thing of course it's going to take quite a bit of computing power so as we sit here today it's not something that would be very practical uh, and so there's always that trade-off between something that gets us maybe better conce at conceptually understanding something, and if we have a breakthrough on the computational end within that domain, then that would be great. Um, but you know what we what we've done, I guess, by emphasizing computing is by sacrificing on the conceptual side. So where do you think it's going to go in the future? How do you think AI will evolve? Oh, I. <laughs> where do you think it'll be? It'll evolve. I, I'm. Well, I think we're going to be more and more reliant on uh, data-driven decisions. I think we already are, and likely the one of the major dangers of AI will be over-reliance, uh, where we will have sufficient uh, sufficiently forgotten the previous 
decision systems or the previous analog systems uh, such that if there are hardware software errors, um, if there is a problem with the, with the software running our lives, that we, will, that we will have to face consequences that are in excess of the gains that we make by implementing the systems in the first place. Yeah, so I mean, the, the over-reliance is something that we can even look at it today um, and see the extent to which we are you know, not even thinking about AI and the way that it actually does uh, uh, impact our lives you know, right now. Things like GPS. Uh, you know, I, I, was, you know, I, I was riding once, I was in LA once trying to get from one place to another. I was riding with a friend of mine and we were following GPS and we were trying to get to Griffiths Observatory. And we were going up a hill, a winding hill for you know, about 15 minutes with a line of cars in front of us and behind us. We get to the top and there's nothing there. There's a, it's somebody's house, right? But the GPS was telling us, was, was taking us there. And presumably all of those other people were taking, were using the same GPS, right? So. We've all, we have become reliant on these technologies to some extent. But even, even outside of that, e even if you distill it a little bit further, just to think about how much have we become, we've already, we already have become reliant, at least in some way. We see the replication crisis coming back to that. We use statistical techniques to draw uh, scientific conclusions, and then that kind of has an effect downstream into what gets funded further and what kind of technologies uh, we try to develop, what gets reported in the news, what types of medicines people take. I mean, these have very far-reaching impact, but at the source, we're relying very heavily on a theory and on a method that has flaws, and we don't always account for those flaws. And I guess one of the, you know, so, th so that's, that's something that's, you know, with us today, and that's, you know, probably only going to grow if we continue to have this maybe this kind of blind trust or this overly optimistic view that AI is, you know, here to solve, you know, can solve all of our problems or something like that. I would, I would certainly caution against that. Um, it's definitely not the view that I take. You know, I, I think that the ability to con contextualize and to learn from, st from structure and to maintain structure and to make decisions, coherent decisions, in a sample, with a sample of size zero and without data. There's no substitute for that. We don't have, that's not what the current movements in AI are, are working towards. And, you know, as long as that's the case, I think that there should be at least some precautions taken when we try to apply uh, these techniques from AI, things like driverless cars or whatever it might be. Um, the immediate benefits might seem clear, but the long-term benefits are always um, less clear and could be much more drastic. Long-term benefits and Cost. consequences, and really, consequences. is what I'm, of course. what I'm talking about. Of course. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for joining us tonight with Dr. Harry Crane. We hope you join us again next time as we explore the frontiers of science and technology with the thinkers creating the future. Thank you.